you and good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and I'm honored. Uh, you know, uh, I just want to just say this. Uh, this has not been about me. Uh, I, I've been blessed. You know, I, I founded Project Purple in 2010. It's been 10, uh, 10 years, 10th anniversary. And I know Bill's been, you know, involved in some capacity since the very beginning. Uh, Dave, you know, has gotten involved with this. Um, you know, over the last year uh, with his diagnosis, but uh, it's, it's really an honor to be here. We're, we're a chamber member as well. So uh, thank you guys for giving us the opportunity. Yesterday was World Pancreatic Cancer Day. So if I look a little tired, I apologize. We had an event that we kicked off actually 41 hours of running straight uh, in 15 minute segments, not one person, but we were passing this uh, figurative torch, as we called it, uh, passing the torch for 41 hours. We started actually in Australia on the 18th. Um, and it's really fascinating to me where Project Purple has gone. Um, you know, we, we have international relationships now, and we had a group of people in Australia that were willing to, you know, run, walk, jog uh, a certain amount of uh, miles in, in 15 minutes. And uh, just really, really amazing. So if I'm tired, I apologize. I was up late last night working on social media, uh, doing Facebook Live. Yesterday was kind of a busy day for us. And we also had a bunch of other events going on. Um, here in my screen, you can see the, the, the tag up above, which says pancreatic cancer isn't canceled. Um, we all live uh, locally or in this area. Um, we just put on our uh, building here, we're in Seymour, Connecticut at one, uh, 115 Main Street. Uh, I had to think there for a second what our address was. Uh, that's pretty scary. But uh, the old Bank of America building, I think, is the best uh, best place uh, to, to kind of give people an idea of where we are, because there's not really a lot of signage outside. But one thing that we have done that I'm really super excited about is there's a billboard that you can see from Route 8 now from both directions, north and south. Um, and that is up on our billboard. So we hope that this is just a gentle reminder to remind people, you know, right now, um, that pancreatic cancer hasn't been canceled and isn't canceled. And, you know, people are still battling, Dave, one of them, um, you know, and that's something, you know, COVID is a very serious thing. It impacts our, you know, base, uh, you know, tremendously in the fact that, you know, people who are battling any cancer, but in pancreatic cancer are immunocompromised, um, you know, and, and so we're not taking COVID, you know, lightly, uh, but we have seen that people have kind of forgotten about pancreatic cancer. Um, and, you know, we, we just have to kind of continually remind people about that. You know, this thing is, is lethal. It's, it's evil, as I call it, this evil disease. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. So um, I know the topic is about early detection. We're going to get into that. But I think before we get there, we've got to kind of understand what pancreatic cancer is. Oh, no. is what some of the symptoms are, the risk statistics. Um, but one thing that I, I think is really promising, you know, we look at what's happening, you know, right now today with COVID and, you know, th th this, these COVID vaccines that are happening. I mean, you guys are all in the health industry, so you get this. I think the general public, there's, there seems to be a lot of nihilism, you know, in terms of, you know, well, I'm not going to take that vaccine. You know, this is crazy. But if you look, I, I read this the other day, you know, and this, this made sense. If you look at the energy and effort that has been into this vaccine, because people say, oh, it takes 10 years for vaccines really to come to, to fruition. The amount of work that's been done in the last eight months equals 10 years of work. So it, it's kind of, you know, if we peel back the layers and look at what's happened, like all of pharma has invested in COVID. So to me, that says, you know, just using that example, that can be done for so many other diseases. And, and I hope, you know, for us here at Project Purple, that, you know, we can get that kind of momentum for pancreatic cancer. And clearly, you know, two weeks ago, we lost, you know, one of the, the biggest icons over the last probably 10 years, um, other than maybe Ruth Bader Ginsburg, but her, her kind of plight was kind of taken politically really quick, but Alex Trebek, you know, someone who, you know, so many people every night after dinner spent, you know, a half hour with Alex, you know, enjoying the family time, enjoying, you know, and he died of pancreatic cancer and it's become like this big beacon of hope for this disease and his passing that potentially we could do something. So I'm going to share my screen here. Um, can everyone see that? Thumbs up. Yes. 
Awesome. Okay. Let me get in here. So, you know, just to talk about some statistics about pancreatic cancer and start from the beginning. So in 2020, 57,000 Americans are expected to be diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Now, if we look statistically, um, you know, among other cancers, and I'll just use breast cancer as a comparison here, you know, what are the, the things that people say about pancreatic cancer is it's, not, you know, it's, it's a, a disease that doesn't impact a lot of people. And that is accurate. Um, because if you compare that to say breast cancer, breast cancer is a 250,000 plus disease, uh, but their survival rate is a lot greater in terms of people, um, you know, who are surviving through that disease. One of the, the challenging problems with pancreatic cancer is, uh, and, and this is really going to hit home as we go through the presentation, is that there is no early detection. We currently do not have a blood test, we don't have diagnostics, um, depending on where patients go, will determine on really, you know, what the doctors, oncologists, G GI specialists use typically are the first people that, that kind of that first line of contact or the general practitioner, there really isn't a set guideline on what should be done diagnostically for patients. Um, and, and then there is no early detection like breast cancer with mammograms, with prostate, with PSA tests, um, and the symptoms, unfortunately, you know, are so vague. Um, and sometimes in, in a lot of people, symptoms don't show until the disease has spread until we have disease progression. Um, so that becomes really challenging to diagnose this thing with no diagnostics, no blood tests. And then you have symptoms that are so vague, um, and that really don't present until the very, you know, end in terms of diagnosis or staging. Surgery, you know, uh, people bring up this question a lot uh, because, you know, surgery and other cancers, you know, is typically the way that they eliminate cancer. They can go in, they can, um, you know, take out the tumor, do clean margins and, and eliminate cancer that way for a lot of cancers. Um, but unfortunately with pancreatic cancer, only one in five are operable. Um, so, you know, surgery isn't an option in terms of eliminating the cancer for a lot of folks. Um, does anyone know where the pancreas is from an, an anatomy standpoint on the body? Dave, you can't, you can't tell, you can't, you can't, uh, right. chime in. That, that's unfair. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> well, so the, the pancreas, for those that don't know, actually sits all the way. If you, if you go to your belly button and then go straight through with, if, you know, if we had like a probe, it actually sits right on the back of your spine uh, or right on your spine actually. So, you know, when we think about surgery though, the surgery that is performed is called a Whipple. It's typically anywhere between eight and 10 hours. And the reason being is because that pancreas sits so far back in that stomach cavity, you know, it's, it's a very evasive, very long surgery. It usually takes about an hour just for the surgeons to get back to that position in the body. And then this also creates some challenges as well because of where the pancreas sits, it also touches a lot of other organs. It touches the small intestine, it touches, it, it, uh, touches close to the liver, it's close to the lungs. So sometimes, you know, depending on the severity of the tumor and if there are METs um, in other places, um, the surgery becomes that more complex. And also, this is a this is an issue with uh, diagnostics as well, uh, because sometimes the cancer will present in other organs uh, because they won't necessarily see it in the pancreas. Less than ten percent of patients will survive five years. Uh, that's a statistic that um, is tough. Uh, but the one thing I will say, if you look statistically back over the last five years, five years ago, the five-year survival rate was only five percent. And here we are five years later and, and we have increased, it's 10%, but it's still far from where it needs to be. 71% of patients will die within the first year of diagnosis. Uh, reason being three out of four patients diagnosed at stage three or greater uh, with this disease. Uh, and again, um, typically only one in five are operable um, and surgeons typically will not operate with anyone over stage two or greater. Sometimes stage two is kind of borderline. Um, so majority of the patients are typically uh, advanced stage disease. In the US, 
Uh, pancreatic cancer is expected to be the number two killer of all cancers by the end of this year nationwide. Uh, lung is number one. Uh, we just uh, surpassed breast cancer a year ago uh, to become number three, and we are going to surpass colon cancer by the end of this year. In the state of Connecticut, though, it is already number two uh, statistically, um, along with many of the states here in New England. So let's talk about symptoms here. Uh, you know, some of the symptoms, you know, again, I said, these are, these are very vague when we see these, but, um, you know, indigestion problems, unexplained weight loss, um, you know, people who just lose weight that are not intentionally trying to lose weight, uh, changes in stool, um, loss of appetite, stomach pain. And um, I'm going to save the, the, the next two for a minute here. But if you think about those indigestion, unexplained weight loss, changes in stool, loss of appetite and stomach pain. Those are so vague. I mean, changes in stool. I mean, people can blame that on something they ate, um, you know, indigestion. How many people have experienced indigestion and just said, Hey, you know, it's stress. It's something I ate weight loss. Uh, potentially that could be a red flag, but you know, if you're dieting or if you're working out and you're losing weight, you could just say, well, Hey, I'm dieting and working out. Uh, loss of appetite against stress. I'm sure people have had a lot of loss of appetite over the last eight months with COVID. Um, and then stomach pain, you know, people tend to throw that up as, you know, I ate something wrong. Uh, I've got stress again, or I'm working out, you know, and I'm doing a lot of abdominal work. So those five are super, super vague. Now the two that, you know, one that's been recently, um, you know, more highlighted, but the jaundice one, which is yellowing, that tends to be, you know, something that people say, oh, well, that that's something with the pancreas or something with your GI tract that we have to look into. But unfortunately, not everyone who gets pancreatic cancer is jaundice. And typically what we have seen that people that do present jaundice in most part are late stage. So at that point, it's kind of, you know, late in the game in terms of diagnosis or symptoms. The one that is that first one there, that new onset diabetes, excuse me, that's something that recently over, <clears throat> excuse me, the new onset diabetes over the last five years has been something that scientists and physicians and clinicians have really been interested in because there is a kind of link to new onset, new onset diabetes. And what we mean by that is people that are 40 and over, are overweight, have never had any underlying health issues, but for some reason get diabetes. So science is thinking that there is kind of a precursor or a link to that, um, that, you know, why is something happening, you know, with diabetes late in life, you've never had any issues, um, you're healthy, uh, it's not due to weight gain, um, it's not like a type two diabetes uh, situation, but you become diabetic, um, so we are starting to understand that those people become a higher risk in the sense that potentially they may have some sort of disease related to the pancreas at some point in the near future. Risk factors, um, obesity, um, you know, people uh, that are overweight, age, diabetes, which we just mentioned family history of pancreatic cancer, pancreatitis, and naturally smoking. So these are kind of, I, I think, you know, we think about smoking, ob obesity, you know, age, you know, as we do age, you, you know, regardless, you know, of the cancer, as we, hurt, as we hit a certain age, 70 plus, um, you know, the odds of having heart disease and cancer like skyrocket, right? Eventually people at certain ages are, are just gonna have certain diseases just because of prolonged life. You know, naturally, obesity is an issue for a, a lot of people in the country, and you know that's something to really be concerned about. You know, we've talked about diabetes. Um, you know, pancreatitis. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I mean, is an inflammation of the pancreas. We do know scientifically that not everyone with pancreatitis gets pancreatic cancer, uh, but in uh, this ongoing prolonged inflammation of the pancreas, for some people, does lead to this disease, leads to the cancer. Uh, smoking, we know, is bad. We've known that for years, and it leads to a lot of cancers, um, you know, and in this case, you know, pancreatic cancer as well. The one that I'm going to talk about, though, here is family history of pancreatic cancer. 
you know, and this is something really over the last like five years that has kind of slingshotted, you know, in terms of focus and energy and effort. And, you know, I, I, when I started Project Purple 10 years ago, I remember meeting this family and they had like five people in their family that had experienced pancreatic cancer. And I kind of was like, at the time, like, wow, there, there's really something in the water, as we would say, like, right, like, why is it that this family is just experiencing this disease, you know, all, you know, everyone in this household, you know, it's just, there's got to be something going on. Is there, just, is there the water? Is it environmental? You know, but one thing that science has done a really great job, you know, is trying to understand genes and genetics and how that impacts diseases. And with pancreatic cancer, the one thing that we do know now is that five to 10% of cases are considered familial or heter hereditary in terms of the disease. So, what we mean by that is your mom and dad, um, you know, they have these genes and those genes are passed down to the, the, the kids. So um, unfortunately we don't get to pick our parents, uh, but the genes that our parents have uh, are passed down to us and then eventually passed down to our children when we have children, right? So by understanding those genes and potential mutations that are in those gene sequencing is critical uh, to pancreatic cancer and also disease prevention. And so if we look at some of these genes, we know that within pancreatic cancer that 10% of the cases are from an inherited genetic syndrome such as Lynch syndrome, palpi 2 CDKN2A, PRSS1, STK11, and then the two that are probably the most common and most popular when people talk about genetic syndromes or inherited risks are the BRCA1 and the BRCA2. And we've got to thank our friends over at the breast cancer groups. You know, they've done a, a tremendous job, you know, with BRCA1 and BRCA2 awareness. Um, you know, the, the best example that comes to my mind is Angelina Jolie, you know, a bunch of years back, um, she did genetic testing and, you know, she had an inherited BRCA mutation. She opted for a double mastectomy. We also know that the BRCA gene is responsible for breast cancer, for uh, ovarian cancer. She went and then did a hysterectomy. And it's also linked to pancreatic cancer along with, uh, excuse me, uh, melanoma and prostate cancer for men. So what we have done, which is really fascinating with this disease is, we've identified that these gene mutations are responsible for the disease. Now, not for everyone, but it, with this 10%. The other fascinating thing is that um, I'm not gonna share information on this on this presentation, but if someone is diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and has one of these underlying genetic syndromes, we have a, a protocol for chemotherapy that works really, really well. Um, so if someone has a BRCA gene mutation and has pancreatic cancer, there is a treatment protocol that works phenomenal uh, for these patients. It allows them better quality of life and extension of life. Um, and th these are recent enhancements to this disease. This, I'm talking about this has happened over the last three years where science has realized that, you know, if we have people with BRCA gene mutations, we have treatment protocols that will actually do very well. Um, the other thing that's happened, and this was mandated last year, was that anyone who is diagnosed with pancreatic cancer across the country, it is required that their tumor have genetic testing. Um, and this was a game changer uh, because a lot of times people that were going into a rural setting that weren't necessarily going into a high volume center, they were not having genetic testing. And we have a podcast, we've had a gen we had a gentleman on the podcast last year, and this is what happened to him. He didn't go into a high volume center. He went into a rural setting. Um, you know, it was a good place, but you know, he went through chem frontline chemotherapy treatment, did not respond very well. Finally, one of uh, his clinicians said, hey, let's do genetic testing, found out that he had a BRCA mutation and he, it was a game changer. Um, he now has no evidence of disease. Um, and, you know, he's living a, a quality, his quality of life skyrocketed. Um, but these are the things that are happening here just in the short term that are making a, a huge, huge difference. So to get back to this, if we know that we have 10% of the population, 
that are getting this disease have these inherited mutations, we can hopefully identify early detection. So if you, if this slide here talks about, you know, hey, if we have 100 people in the room, we know that 10% of, 10, 10 or 10 of them have this genetic mutation, we can put these folks and their families into high risk because we know what genes they're passed on, right? And we know that there's, an, it, there's a risk now that if you have this gene, your risk goes up of potentially getting the disease, we can put people into high risk screening and monitoring and create a roadmap. Pancreatic cancer has no roadmap. And that's the real reason why we don't have an early detection test. We, we're still trying to look and find what, what is the marker? What is the, the thing, the catalyst that causes people to get this disease? But if we know that this 10% are at high risk and not everyone's gonna get it, but some of them will. And, but if we have this roadmap and, and we have them in early surveillance, well, we're gonna find out two things. One is we're gonna find out when they do present with disease at a very early stage, but also we're gonna be able to identify what is causing that disease. And so that is what precede this consortium <coughs> that we uh, established. So I, I'm like super excited because you know, we, I had this idea with a clinician at NYU, Dr. Diane Simeone, about four years ago. Um, we were talking about, uh, you know, how do we create early detection in pancreatic cancer? Um, and there, there's a lot of things going on. There's blood biomarkers that are being talked about. But, you know, Proceed is this highly collaborative international effort to improve survival of pancreatic cancer by proving early detection screening, risk modeling, and prevention for those with a heritable risk of pancreatic cancer. It's the largest of its kind. We actually have 36 centers worldwide, seven different um, countries, and we are following high-risk families and patients that have these genetic mutations to learn from them, to understand, and to come up with an early detection protocol for high-risk patients, and eventually pancreatic cancer patients. The fascinating thing is um, these centers that are involved are all sharing this data, which is really, you know, outside of, you know, science. Usually you have centers that are, you know, siloed and they're, they're not necessarily sharing their data. We're requiring them to share their data. And I'll talk a little bit about that, how we're doing that. This is a group picture from our, uh, we had a, a meeting last December in New York, and you can see just from the vastness, um, you know, of, of all the groups that are involved, all these wonderful scientists, clinicians, GI specialists, oncologists that are super passionate about finding early detection for this disease. Um, our goals, you know, one of the main goals, and there, there's seven here that we've identified, but, you know, the one that I, I really get excited about is really that first one is to increase survival of patients diagnosed with pancreatic cancer to 50% in the next 10 years. And, and I think we can do that. You know, we, we are gonna identify high-risk individuals to advance early detection research and clinical care, validate early detection blood tests, enhance communication tools uh, for patients and healthcare providers, identify new cancer uh, susceptibility genes, lead functional studies to understand the contribution of specific germline mutation alterations to pancreatic cancer biology and develop prevention strategies for high-risk individuals. So with Pre-Seed, um, you know, what's happening is you, people are being screened for genetics. So if a family member um, who has a loved one who has battled pancreatic cancer or uh, someone who is battling pancreatic cancer, um, they may or may not have a genetic, the, the person who has battled pancreatic cancer may or may not have a, a gene mutation, but if there is a prevalence of pancreatic cancer or cancer in that family, people can get screened at one of the 35 centers or 36 centers worldwide, meet with a genetic counselor, and then if they qualify for the study, uh, they come in once a year, they give blood, and they take a survey and they also alternate from an endoscopic ultrasound, which is an EUS, which uh, you know, you're, you're put under uh, local anesthesia, put to sleep. And then you know, the EUS, the uh, GI specialist goes down, looks at everything inside, they biopsy anything. And then the other diagnostic test that we're alternating from is a MRI. So every other year, if you're in the study, you're giving, you're giving blood every year, but then you're also alternating from an EUS and an MRI. 
Um, you know, the people that will benefit from this is, you know, people who are at elevated risk of pancreatic cancer. And, you know, as I said before, you know, if we have these high risk people in this screening protocol, and, and think about what I just said, they're coming in every year for diagnostic testing, we are going to be able to find people at an early stage. So these people that are at higher risk, this is going to lead to larger survival. It's going to lead to that roadmap. And we're also going to be able to create and validate, you know, potentially a blood test because we're taking blood. Um, you know, none of the groups are working on validating the blood test. That's not kind of in our scope. They might have other people at their centers that potentially are working with that. But we're blank, we're going to bank thousands and thousands of vials of blood. And guess what? If someone does develop the disease, we potentially will have years of their blood prior to and when they get sick that now if there is a blood test or if there is someone out there that wants to do validation on that blood, we have that. Here are just some of the centers uh, that are listed. Um, two that I want to make note of, Arbor Research Collaborative for Health. Um, what's really fascinating about this, I, I talked about data sharing, is we went out and we hired Arbor Research Collaborative for Health out of Arbor, Michigan, Ann Arbor, Michigan, excuse me, to be the main data hub. So not one center is holding all the data. It's all third party, which really makes this really wild and fascinating. And, and I get really excited about it because it's not NYU, it's not Mayo, it's not Moffitt, it's not UNMC, it's not uh, Sheba in Israel that is responsible for holding that data. It's Arbor, this third party. And everyone has access to it. Um, NYU is the other partner that I wanted to mention, You know, Dr. Diane Simeone, who is... Uh, really just a powerhouse in this space is really leading the charge. And she's been a big reason, you know, and a, and a great partner in helping build out Precede uh, with us. Uh, this is just some of the people on our team. Um, as you can see, these are uh, the leaders and at their individual uh, locations that are responsible for really moving the needle here with early detection with Precede. Um, what I wanted to do more, so that there are, uh, do I still have a couple minutes here? I think I'm good. So um, here are two links, uh, precedeconsortium.org and projectpurple.org. Um, I want to uh, thank you guys, but before I do that, I want to show you just really quick our Precede Consortium. So this is what the website looks like. Um, so if you guys want to learn more, I would definitely recommend going to precedeconsortium.org or if you have friends or family that are high risk or that have questions about this, uh, this is the place to go. Um, it's super easy to navigate. As you scroll down, uh, there's information about Precede, talks a little bit about who will benefit, how to get involved. Um, you, people you know, you're not, you're actually not sharing the uh, website. Oh, I'm not? We just need the thank you slide. Oh, okay. All right. Let me get back in there. Sorry about that. No worries. Uh, I think I'm going to have to do this. I'll stop share and then let me go back in and share this. Sorry. Can you guys see that now? Uh, yep. Yeah. Yes. All right. So as I was saying, this is the Precede website, precedeconsortium.org. Um, so it's, it's pretty easy to navigate. You scroll down, um, you know, I talked about this. You can contact us for more information, our goals. Um, we've got a really cool video. I'm not gonna play it. You guys can watch it on your own time that comes from our meeting, but this is really, you know, where I wanted to show you. So with our partners, and you can see here locally, Yale is part of the study actually, uh, which has been a great partner for us here in this consortium. But if you toggle over, and I'll just toggle over Yale, it'll actually bring you to Yale's center. Um, so this is the great thing. So if you have friends and family in other parts of the country or other parts of the world, um, as I mentioned, there's six partners, international partners. We've got a partner in Israel with Sheba Medical Center. Um, we've got two in Germany. We've got two in Canada. Um, and then Italy uh, just came on board. And I believe, so I apologize. I believe there's seven uh, partners. Um, 
there's one more, uh, UK, I'm sorry, UK. So um, if you <clears throat> have friends and family in other parts of the world or other parts of the country, um, like Nebraska here, you just click on, again, hyperlink, it'll bring you to their center. So this is really kind of user-friendly. People can really dive in and get information on these centers, um, their process, um, you know, and, and it really uh, has allowed the patients you know, one thing that, you know, we've heard a lot about, you know, is just really advocating for themselves, you know, and this really puts the power back into the patient's hands or these high risk families to learn and get more information. Um, so um, at this point, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, I think someone had raised their hand. Yes, Dr. Stephanie has her hand raised. Go ahead, Dr. Stephanie. Unmute. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi, Dino. How you doing? Good, how you? Um, good, good. So um, a while back, I had contacted NYU. That was kind of far for me. You were saying Yale has now the early detection center. Would I be able to work through with them? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, uh, what, when we originally launched this um, and when we were thinking about the idea, you know, NYU was kind of the main hub. And, and so not to bore you guys with details, but what happens is because we have all these centers, every center has to agree to share data, right? Um, and there's uh, those that work in, in the medical field probably know this term in IRB. Um, so what was happening was, um, Stephanie, I don't know if at the time, like Precede was even, you know, in- the, No, it wasn't. This is the first so, I'm hearing of it. Yeah, so I was so, excited to listen to you. And, and this is exciting for me because I just, at that point, I just couldn't do, you know, I, they were wonderful at NYU, but- to do something closer. Um, yeah, we're, so we're excited. Yeah, Yale. And so Yale is on board, their IRB is in place so they can actually start seeing patients. So what had happened with a lot of these centers, um, their IRB wasn't fully uh, executed. So we can't promote their center until that IRB comes yeah. in, right? So, also, what about the, the KRAS gene? I remember it wasn't on the list, is well, that? So KRAS is not a genetic mutation. Everyone in our, everyone in the world has KRAS. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. These are, oh, I see what you mean. It's not, yeah. I thought it was just the genes that could be involved, but these are, okay, I see what it yeah. is. I mean, KRAS mutation is responsible. It's a, it's a gene that we all have. Yeah. Uh, for some reason in, um, you know, adenocarcinomas, uh, KRAS is responsible for like 75% of those uh, adenocarcinomas that yeah. present in pancreatic cancer. So why does that happen? Science still doesn't know. And, and there's a lot of work that's still being done to that. You know, these BRCA and these other, you know, Palpy and Lynch syndrome mutations are different than KRAS. You know, you could have a BRCA mutation and you can also have KRAS in your body. You know, it's just a matter of which mutates uh, potentially, you know, but so, but we do know that with these BRCA mutations, you know, that you have a, a higher probability of getting the disease than you would if you just had a KRAS, you know, cause everyone yeah. has KRAS. Can I just share about my mom for a second? Yeah, yeah. So basically, so my mom had IBS, she had GI issues for years and we were treating her for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And then she started to have pain that wrapped around the left side from the front to the back. And, um, she's not one who complains about a lot. So this is really important. When you have a um, new onset of symptoms, it's really important to, to listen to that. So she called the doctor and didn't speak to the doctor, spoke, spoke to his assistant and she was describing and what was going on. And she said, okay, I can get you in whenever. And she's like, no, I'm in pain. I usually don't complain. There is something going on. You get me. If he's too busy, then I'm going to another doctor. So he called her that day and she described what was going on. She had some weight loss from changing her diet, but it was a lot more weight loss than she should have. He got her in that day. They did a blood test so that she could get the, um, the scan the very next day. And he called me and I mean, I was working all day. So it was after hours, her GI doctor gave me the cell phone number. And, um, you know, I knew things, you know, that weekend we found out about the tumor 
but she was really adamant. She's like, no, she's like, there's something wrong with me. This is different. I've never had it before. And as she was working with her GI issues, those issues would have been the things that got worse, not these brand new issues. So, um, I mean, and that was really telling. I mean, right away, you know, he got her in. So, you know, don't ignore uh, sudden onset of symptoms. Best case scenario is you just have indigestion or something. But, you know, if, you, if there's a big change and a sudden onset, I mean, that's what I really look. I look, you know, when people come into me, you know, onset, duration, you know, all those factors. But um, like this one, like it's hard. I mean, by that time, she was stage 3B. She could have had surgery, but it, um, the tumor was right by her um, abdominal aorta. So the surgery was too risky. Um, she was around 81. It was about quality, not quantity. So with naturopathic stuff, we got her two and a half months symptom free and, um, you know, she eventually passed, but, um, yeah, just really know, get to know your body. It's, it's really important. Like Dino said, it's the symptoms are very vague, but, you know, as you understand your body more, um, you know, and, and just really take care of yourself. That's key. Dino, you know, I, uh, Bill Purcell. Yeah, you know, I wonder if you could share with the group your your uh, fundraising model, your very unique fundraising model, um, the uh, the amount that you've raised and distributed um, is really a, really a spectacular. And then I want, if you might, just introduce Dave Kelly, Chamber Director, um, one of our dear friends, uh, David. You might just contribute to the conversation. So, Dino, could you put put the big picture in perspective? Yeah, um, and I just want to answer a quick question. So someone asked, asked if uh, can the tumor be detected with a CAT scan or PET scan? So yeah, tumors naturally, if they're presentable enough, can you know CAT scan or MRI even you know high contrast pancreatic cancer, uh, you know contrast MRI with a special dye. You know, you know the the challenging part, and you know uh, Dave can maybe you know talk maybe a little bit about this. Uh, you know, you know diagnostics is only as good as you know when when they put in those contrast agents. You know, um, if the contrast agent adheres to the tumor, um, you know, so diagnostically we've got to get better. And, and you know, this is this is a disease issue. There's just not enough funding, you know. And this is why what we do is so critical. Um, you know, if you look at funding as a whole, and and this is what keeps me up at night. One of the things, you know, with COVID, you know, the government is 80% of the the government funds 80% of the the cancer research in the country. I don't know if everyone knows that. Like everyone thinks philanthropy does it, like private philanthropy. That's not the case. It's the government. We rely on the government for a lot of research. And so with COVID, there's a big concern among the scientific committee that you know budgets are going to be, you know, flat. Um, you know, and here's a disease that, you know, we only get 2% of the NIH's budget and we fight, fight, fight for everything. Now, the good news is this is the first time in the history of the United States that pancreatic cancer has its own designated bill, 15 million. Congress was nice enough to add 10 million to the tab when John Lewis died. Um, and then now RBG passed away. So it'll be the largest haul for pancreatic cancer research ever. But, the, you know, the one thing with the NIH is they only fund basic research. They don't do early detection like we're doing early detection or anything, you know, clinical trial based or anything outside the box, which is understandable, but we'll take it. So, um, you know, to, to Bill's uh, question, you know, uh, you know, our fundraising model, you know, has always been, you know, getting together in groups, running, uh, being involved in, in some of the world's largest marathons. Clearly with COVID, that all changed. Um, so, you know, everything that we're doing is virtual now. Um, we are, you know, optimistic that we'll get back to running some of these marathons in 21. I don't know when. Um, none of them have given us any indication other than the Chicago Marathon that just announced yesterday that their intention is to have a race on the 21st of October 21. I don't know. Thanksgiving is canceled in Chicago. I don't know how they're going to put on a race in October, but you know, I, I worry about what we can control. So, uh, you know, the, our funding that we, you know, we've, we've got a lot of virtual events. We've got a Thanksgiving event going on. We're going to be rolling out some other virtual events here over the next couple of weeks uh, that are virtually. We hope to be getting involved in some golf stuff. 
uh, you know, potentially for 21, um, doing stuff outdoors, social distancing, you know, again, as I mentioned in the beginning, you know, our, our community is immunocompromised, so we don't want to encourage people getting together and God forbid someone were to get sick and, and you know, get COVID and, you know, have to deal with that along with pancreatic cancer. So, you know, it, it's been, um, you know, Bill, we embraced running and that was something that I loved. And then we got into fitness and then we got into doing our own runs and walks. Um, you know, things have changed because of COVID, but we hope to continue to do those things in the future, either in a virtual setting, having people do them at home or, you know, when and if we can get back and gather together, you know, and continue to do those things, we'll continue to do that. Um, you know, Dave, uh, I'd love for, you know, Dave to say some things here, uh, you know, Bill actually introduced me to Dave. Uh, so thank you, Bill, once again, for another introduction. You've been a, a, a great cheerleader for us, you know, over the years. And uh, I've been blessed to, to get to know Dave. Uh, his sons have eaten pizza for us at our pizza <laughs> contest. Lost, right. Yeah. <laughs> They're too skinny, too skinny. Yeah. They, they can eat, but they, they couldn't. Well, you but, know, the, you know, the Dino, you know, um, you know, meeting you is, is, uh, I think, I think for everybody, the you know what what Dino is for me is one word, and that's hope. And and when you're when you're diagnosed with with uh, stage four pancreatic cancer, yeah, uh, I didn't have any. I don't have the 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 BRCA gene in my family. There's no one in my family that has cancer. And you know um, the 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 really positive thing about not having that gene is that I have. Six, six grandchildren and three sons, and, and I'm not passing on a, a gene that can disrupt their, their lives. Um, so, um, you know, for, unfortunately, it's, it's, uh, I was diagnosed the same day that Alex Trebek was. And so his passing obviously hit me pretty hard. I'm like, oh boy, you know, and, and I actually asked my oncologist, I'm like, you know, how did he die? You know, well, how do I know when I'm gonna die? And, and, and when you have this disease, it's really, it, it, it makes your life finite. So it's, it's not that difficult to ask the tough questions because you want to be there for your family as long as you can and for your friends. And, and um, you know, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's been really hard for me uh, ha having to, to stop working. And, and uh, actually Tuesday, I start my 40th chemo treatment. So, uh, you know, as Dino and I had talked, you know, a lot and, and the oncologist too at, at Yale Smilo, they're like, you know, after six or eight chemo treatments, a lot of people just pack it in and say, I can't deal with this. You know, I, I can't. But, you know, everybody's different. And so for me, I'm a fighter and, and uh, I hold that hope. And right now, you know, there's a lot of really positive um, trials that are going on at Yale. And, and I'm hoping in 2021 to get on to it to one of those that literally shrinks tumors. Um, I'm not on it now because I have a, a, a situation in my abdomen where the, um, the cancer is spreading and tumors are growing. So right now we're really attacking that area. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, get stay into the, to the early detection theme, you know, with, with Dino and, and, you know, I lost probably 35 pounds and I attributed it to all the traveling that I was doing. I had traveled my whole life, but um, and, and I was always, but this time I was getting tired and, um, really not feeling well and, and couldn't eat. And when I ate, um, you know, my first visit was to the, was to the men's room. And so, um, I knew something was wrong. So when I went to the doctor, the doctor's first diagnosis was take Metamucil for a month. So like a soldier, you know, I trust the doctors and, and, um, in, uh, in around, Christmas time in 2019, I started my Metamucil regimen, I call it. And so I, for about six weeks I was taking and then, hey, every morning the orange juice tasted pretty good, but obviously that wasn't what the issue was. So when I called my doctor back and I said, you know, I'm still not feeling, I'm feeling out of sorts. Then I went to the GI and uh, he felt my stomach and he felt around and he's like, you need to get a, a CT scan immediately. And within, you know, 24 hours, I was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic. And, and uh, so, um, again, uh, uh, um, my story is that I'm fighting and, and you know, uh, faith is extremely important and family and, and having hope. 
you know, Project Purple and, and Dino's work uh, is is just incredible. And, and, and I think about it every day and, and, and uh, you know, and, and I'm one of those guys that's optimistic. You know, if I get to 80 chemo treatments and there's an immunotherapy drug that, that allows me to live um, my life or, or I can help someone out. Um, by being in one of these trials, you know, then, then that's, that's great. And, and if the Lord takes me, you know, um, uh, you know, I, I want to be able to share, you know, my experiences so that, you know, um, I can help others. So it is early detection is really critical. And, and, and like Dino said, you know, it's, there's no, you know, take a blood test and Hey, you know, you, you, you have to start treatments. I mean, I, I, it really hit me hard going from absolutely, um, traveling and working hard for 43 years to, to, uh, you know, having stage four pancreatic, it was, uh, it's, it's still tough to talk about, but, um, you know, I'm living it and, and, and chemo's keeping me alive and it's a terrible, it, let me tell you, it's not fun. Um, you know, it makes you sick and, and, uh, but, uh, like I always say, I, I get chemo every week. And, and so for three days, um, I have what I call the chemo hangover, but I get a couple of good days. And, um, you know, today I feel great. It's a Friday. So usually on a Friday, I'm feeling pretty good. And then uh, Tuesday morning, when I when I go to the Smilo Cancer Center, I always leave the car and, and you know, tell my wife, it's like, oh, I feel really good right now. But I know <laughs> in about three hours, you know, I'm going to feel like, you know what? So uh, but, you know, uh, uh, again, uh, it's all about hope and, and the work that Dino's doing. And, and, and I'm so appreciative for him. Uh, and, and what Project Purple is doing. And, and, and obviously the Yale Smilo nurses are absolutely phenomenal. I love them. They, they, uh, they make you feel so, so, um, so good when, you, when you're there and, and their passion and their care for you is, is just, it's just unbelievable. And, uh, but, uh, you know, other than that, um, uh, you know, uh, I'm, uh, again, uh, thankful that I'm still here. I mean, uh, let if, if I might, um, thank you, David, if, uh, yep. for your courage and, and your message. Um, I, I want to share with the group as a follow-up. Uh, Dino and, and uh, Dave did a podcast uh, a couple of months ago. It's, it's uh, about 45, maybe 50 minutes long. Maybe uh, Laura uh, and Deborah, we can share it with them. But let me just say this. Uh, Dino, I met you 10 years ago, and it was Rob Lesko, the board chairman of the chamber, who introduced us. We were up at Antonio's restaurant, and I recall... Um, I was struck then by your passion, uh, your Hollywood good looks. Uh, I've been calling you Al Pacino ever since. Uh, but, uh, you know, Dino, in, in memory of your dad, um, I just marvel at what you've accomplished. Um, you've uh, yeah. uh, had a great career in the uh, financial advisory firm that you were running and then uh, since devoted uh, all your energies and your passion to this cause. And it's centered right here in our valley. And you're having a world impact, a global impact. Like, I couldn't be prouder of you. Um, mm -hmm. And David, I couldn't be prouder of you. And you are such an inspiration. I see the, the comments in the chat. So I'm going to urge folks to, to listen in to the podcast. So thank you both thank you. so much for being with us this morning. Deborah, back to you. Yes, I know. Um, just